but we want you to read with some feeling, uh, and, and so you are, you are acting. The author of the piece was Fred Tatsuburo Korematsu. This morning, we will tell you his story through reenactments of legal proceedings, drawn from transcripts, court decisions, and other contemporaneous documents. David columnist Henry McElmore wrote as follows. I am for the immediate removal of every Japanese on the West Coast to a point deep in the interior. And I don't mean a nice part of the interior either. Hurt them up, pack them off, and give them the inside room in the Badlands. Let them be punched, hurt, hungry, and dead up against it. Personally, I hate the Japanese, and that goes for all of them. DeWitt wrote to the Secretary of War on February 14th as follows. In the war in which we are now engaged, Racial affinities are not severed by migration. The Japanese race is an enemy race. And while many second and third generation Japanese born on United States soil, possessed of United States citizenship, have become Americanized, the racial strains are unreluded. It therefore follows that along the vital Pacific coast, over 112,000 potential enemies of Japanese extraction are at large today. There are indications that these are organized and ready for concerted action at a favorable opportunity. Mr. Korematsu, will you tell the board where you were born? Oakland, California. And how old are you? I am 23 years old. Where do you live? I live with my parents in Eden Street, Oakland, where I've resided for 23 years. Well, where is your family now? They're at Tamfara Assembly Center. And where were your parents born? They were both born in Japan. Do you have siblings? Yes, three brothers. We were all born in Oakland. Can you please tell the court your educational background? I went to grammar school in Oakland and graduated from the Castleman High School in Oakland. I attended Los Angeles Community College for three months in 1938, where I studied chemistry. I had to abandon my studies because I couldn't earn enough to support myself. What happened then? I returned to work for my father in his nursery in Oakland. When your family was required to evacuate, what did you do? I stayed in Oakland to earn enough money to take my girl with me to the Middle West. Her name is Miss Ida Boitano. She's a different nationality, Italian. Are you an American citizen? Yes, I have never renounced my American citizenship. Now, Mr. Korematsu, are you willing to serve in the U.S. war effort? As a citizen of the United States, I am ready and willing to bear arms for this country. I registered for the draft, but because of physical defects, I was rejected by the Army. So I studied welding and worked in a shipyard on ships used in the war effort. I became a foreman in the shipyard, but was eventually discharged because of my Japanese ancestry. Are you loyal to any country other than the U.S.? No, sir. I am not. Mr. Korematsu, are you familiar with the Japanese language? No, sir. I never attended any Japanese school. I cannot read Japanese. I understand a little when it is spoken. I speak it in broken English. As my mother does not understand my broken speech, my older brother interprets my English into Japanese for her. This is your bully. You may cross-examine. Thank you, Mr. Karamatsu, was your birth registered with the Japanese government for dual citizenship? No, sir. There was some discussion of registration long ago. My father said he didn't care. My brothers said there was no sense in it. My brothers and I, naturally, we belong to this country, and we don't know any other country. Now, you've never served in the U.S. military, have you? I was willing to enlist in the Army but I had stomach ulcers and the doctors told me I was not fit for service. When I was rejected for the draft, I spent $150 out of my own pocket to study welding and then went to work in the shipyards as a welder. You indicated in your written statement, sir, that you intended to give yourself up. Is that correct? Yes. That is why I was near the assembly area in San Leandro. But you did not give yourself up, did you? No, I was arrested before I could do so. In fact, you assumed the name Clyde Sarah to escape arrest and registration, didn't you? Yes. I sought to delay registration so that I could be with my girlfriend a little longer, but later thought better of it. On May 30th, I was intending to register. 
And at the San Leandro Police Headquarters, you used this fake name, Clyde Sarah. And you told the officers that your parents were of Spanish and Hawaiian ancestry and had died in a fire. <coughs> Isn't that right? Yes, I, I did those things. And you also had surgery in an attempt to conceal your identity. Isn't that correct? I had an operation on my face to conceal my identity as a person of Japanese ancestry. I, I don't think it worked. At Tanfred, everyone knew me, and my folks didn't know the difference. <laughs> That's all I have. Mr. Cormanson, please rise. The court hereby finds the defendant, Fred Clay Saburo Cormanson, guilty as charged. It is ordered that the defendant be placed on probation for a period of five years. It is further ordered that pronouncing of judgment be suspended. Although Fred had been sentenced to probation and therefore would ordinarily have been permitted, permitted to go free, subject to supervision, the military police immediately took Fred into custody. Mr. Chief Justice, and may please the court. Can a loyal American citizen be branded a criminal for resisting military orders that banished him from his home and imprisoned him in a concentration camp solely because of his ancestry? The answer, your honors, is no. When Mr. Korematsu was ordered to report for evacuation, there was no military necessity for exclusion. The government asks this court to take judicial notice of General DeWitt's final report, even though it recites so-called facts that were never placed in evidence during Mr. Korematsu's trial. It contains only unsupported allegations that Japanese Americans committed acts of sabotage and espionage. It was the prevention of these acts that, that was the purported rationale for the issuance of Executive Order 9066 and the curfew and exclusion orders. But there is no evidence of any such acts by Japanese Americans. Not a single one. Mr. Collins, did Mr. Kuramatsu conceitedly, quote, remain in, end quote, a restricted area after notice to him that he was required to leave? Mr. Chief Justice, the only place Mr. Kuramatsu could lawfully remain in was the assembly center to which all Japanese Americans in that area were required to report, and from which they would be shipped to a relocation center. In both the assembly center and the relocation center, Mr. Korematsu would have been under detention, a word that does not appear in either Executive Order 9066 or Public Law 503. That detention, indefinite in duration, deprived Mr. Korematsu of his liberty without due process of law, in violation of the Fifth Amendment, all in the name of non-existent military necessity. The final report does not rely on facts, but on hearsay and assumptions about the Japanese as an enemy race. Does your argument come to this, that there is no rational basis for the exclusion order? Can we say that there were no other facts that General DeWitt knew? The final report, Justice Frankfurter, does not contain any facts, only unsupported allegations. How are we to say that General DeWitt did not have any other facts? Justice Jackson, the government admits in its brief that General DeWitt based his military judgment on tendencies and probabilities as evidenced by attitudes, opinions, and slight experience, rather than a conclusion based upon objectively ascertainable facts. I respectfully submit that such a conjectural and unsubstantiated statement meets no standard that comports with the Constitution. I direct the Court's attention to the extraordinary footnote in the government's brief, and I quote, We have specifically recited in this brief the facts relating to the justification for the evacuation, of which we ask the Court to take judicial notice, and we rely upon the final report only to the extent that it relates to such facts. If the government expects the court to rely on the final report, surely more is required. The argument of military necessity reflects no more than General DeWitt's claim that Japanese Americans are members of an enemy race and predisposed by their racial characteristics to disloyalty. We urge the court to reject this claim to reverse the conviction of Mr. Korematsu and to restore to him and all Japanese Americans still held in detention the constitutional rights that all Americans of whatever ancestry 
are entitled to enjoy. Do you suggest any ground on which this court could say that you can detain these people in the way they were detained in a relocation center? Temporarily during evacuation, yes. That would not justify detaining them permanently if hostility to them should continue. That is correct, Your Honor. Where would detention to protect them end? What will ever terminate this business? Your Honor, detention in the assembly centers, as I have pointed out, was a method of accomplishing evacuation. It is one thing to submit to imprisonment to go through a period of sifting to determine one's loyalty to his country. It may be an entirely different thing to submit to indefinite imprisonment without any opportunity for such sifting to take place. These people suffered hardships and inconveniences and temporary deprivation of their liberties and freedom. But it must be viewed in the perspective of this whole war. Millions of people, including hundreds of thousands of our own citizen, citizens, have already become casualties of the war. This program should not, under the Bill of Rights, be looked at as isolated from the whole of which it is part. All citizens alike, both in and out of uniform, feel the impact of war in greater or lesser measure. Citizenship has its responsibilities, as well as its privileges, and in time of war, the burden is always heavier. Korematsu was not excluded from the military area because of hostility to him or his race. He was excluded because we are at war with the Japanese Empire, because the properly constituted military authorities feared an invasion of the West Coast and felt constrained to take proper security measures because they decided the military urgency of the situation demanded that all citizens of Japanese ancestry be segregated from the West Coast temporarily. And finally, because Congress, reposing its confidence in this time of war in our military leaders, as inevitably it must, determined that they should have the power to do just that. There was evidence of disloyalty on the part of some. The military authorities considered that the need for action was great, and time was short by the Constitution. And finally, Justice Jackson. Korematsu was born on our soil, of parents born in Japan. The Constitution makes him a citizen of the United States by nativity and a citizen of California by residence. No claim is made that he is not loyal to this country. Korematsu, however, has been convicted of an act not commonly a crime. It consists merely of being present in the state whereof he is a citizen, near the place where he was born, and where all his life he has lived. Now, if any fundamental assumption underlies our system, it is that guilt is personal and not inheritable. But here is an attempt to make an otherwise innocent act a crime merely because this prisoner is the son of parents as to whom he had no choice, and belongs to a race from which there is no way to resign. Much is said of the danger to liberty from the Army program for detaining these citizens of Japanese extraction. But a judicial construction of the Due Process Clause that will sustain this order is a far more subtle blow to liberty than the promulgation of the order itself. Once a judicial opinion rationalizes such an order to show that it conforms to the Constitution, or rather rationalizes the Constitution to show that the Constitution sanctions such an order, the court for all time has validated the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure and of transplanting American citizens. The principle then lies about like a loaded weapon ready for the hand of any authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. I do not suggest that the court should have attempted to interfere with the army in its task, but I do not think they may be asked to execute a military expedient that has no place in law under the Constitution. I would reverse the judgment and release the prisoner. Your Honor, I still remember 40 years ago when I was handcuffed and arrested as a criminal. As an American citizen being put through this shame and embarrassment, and all Japanese American citizens who were escorted to concentration camps suffered the same embarrassment, we can never forget this incident as long as we live. 
The horse stalls that we stayed in were made for horses, not human beings. According to the Supreme Court decision, being an American citizen was not enough. They say you have to look like them. Otherwise, they say you can't tell the difference between a loyal and disloyal American. I thought that this decision was wrong, and I still feel that way. As long as my record stands in federal court, any American citizen can be held in prison or concentration camps without a trial or a hearing. That is, if they look like an enemy of our country. Therefore, I would like to see the government admit that they were wrong and do something about it, do something about it, so that this will never happen again to any American citizen of any race, creed, or color. Thank you, Mr. Koramatsu. Koramatsu Institute in San Francisco has carried on his work of telling the story of the Japanese American experience in World War II. Through Karen's efforts, 10 states have recognized January 30, Fred's birthday, as Fred Korematsu Day. On December 19, 2017, the City Council of New York City established January 30 annually as Fred T. Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. As the City Council recognized in its resolution, Fred's courage in fighting for justice and civil liberties furthered the cause of equality for Asian Americans and made them an inspiration for all Americans. In his majority opinion, Justice Roberts upheld the travel ban, but addressed the Korematsu case as follows, closing with a quote from Justice Jackson's dissenting opinion. The dissent invokes Korematsu versus United States. Whatever theoretical advantage this dissent may see in doing so, Korematsu has nothing to do with this case. The forcible relocation of United States citizens to concentration camps solely and explicitly on the basis of race is objectively unlawful and outside the scope of presidential authority. But it is wholly inapt to liken that morally repugnant order to a facially neutral policy denying certain foreign nationals the privilege of admission. The dissent references to Korematsu, however, affords this court the opportunity to make express what is already obvious. Korematsu was gravely wrong the day it was decided, has been overruled in the court of history, and to be clear, has no place in law under the Constitution. In her dissent, joined by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Sotomayor wrote as follows. In years since Korematsu, our nation has done much to leave its sordid legacy behind. Today, the court takes the important step of finally overruling Korematsu. This formal repudiation of a shameful precedent is laudable and long overdue but it does not make the majority's decision here acceptable or right. By blindly accepting the government's misguided invitation to sanction a discriminatory policy motivated by animosity toward a disfavored group, all in the name of a superficial claim of national security, the court redeploys the same dangerous logic underlying Korematsu and merely replaces one gravely wrong decision with another. Our Constitution demands, and our country deserves, a judiciary willing to uphold the coordinate branches to account when they defy our most sacred legal commitments. Because the court's decision today has failed in that respect, with profound regret, I dissent. The New York Times published an op-ed by Karen Koromatsu. Karen wrote as follows. On Tuesday, the Supreme Court got it partly right. After nearly 75 years, the court officially overruled Koromatsu versus United States. But the court's repudiation of the Koromatsu decision tells only half the story. Although it correctly rejected the, the abhorrent race-based relocation and incarceration of Japanese Americans, it failed to recognize and reject the rationale that led to that infamous decision. 
My father spent his life fighting for justice and educating people about the inhumanity of the Japanese American incarceration so that we would learn from our mistakes. Although he would be somewhat glad that his case was finally overruled, he would be upset that it was cited while upholding discrimination against another marginalized group. The court's decision replaced one injustice with another nearly 75 years later. My father would still say, stand up for what is right. husband and wife, and we've been doing these reenactments for about 12 years now with the uh, Asian American uh, Bar Association of New York. We've taken historic cases um, and tried to find uh, the actual transcripts and other original uh, uh, documents, and, and we put them into um, a, a play, uh, a one-hour uh, play. This one ran a little bit longer because we had to update it. Uh, rewrite the ending uh, with the uh, uh, travel ban decision uh, from, uh, from uh, last year. Um, these are great teaching tools. We have a team of, of uh, lawyers uh, and judges in New York City um, with the Asian American Bar Association of New York, Anna Mercado, uh, who helped organize all of this, by the way, uh, together with the support of the Jackson Center, is on our uh, team. And we come up with cases, we do the research, we find the transcripts, uh, and then we write them uh, into uh, uh, these, these plays. And we try to pick cases that raise issues that are still uh, important today. Um, the Asian American Bar Association has a website on the trial reenactments that describes our uh, 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 cases. Uh, the, the Second Circuit, uh, the court uh, of which I am a, a member, has stolen the idea and, and, and created a similar <laughs> website. And the, and, and the concept is that uh, schools, bar associations, community groups can uh, email in and request scripts and then take them back to their communities to do them. This is the seventh or eighth time that we are doing uh, this forum officer presentation which we only wrote a couple of years ago. You heard Karen talk about it. Uh, but this will prove to be a very popular one. One of our scripts, uh, The Murder of Vincent Chin in Detroit in the early 1980s, has been presented more than 30 times all around the country, including by, for example, the Department of Justice. And Kathy and I actually traveled to um, Switzerland uh, to do it with an international cast uh, um, um, at one point. So um, you should feel free to, to check out uh, uh, the, 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 the websites and, and to check out the, the different uh, programs. Justice Jackson's grandson, playing Justice Jackson. Mm -hmm.